Well, uh, hello again. Today, um, August 24th, 2023, at Tartan University, we have a guest uh, professor who will present a topic which is uh, very hot uh, and relevant. Uh, and I will allude to that in a moment. And the topic is, of course, nothing other than machine learning for wireless communications. Uh, well, I am Halim Yanukomeroğlu, a faculty member at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, we have uh, these uh, weekly seminars, and once in a while we have guests from outside campus as well, and then I uh, announce uh, uh, those to a broader audience like today. Um, machine learning is not a new topic for sure, and there are a number of angles um, how you can view this paradigm. Uh, it might be from a probability theory perspective, computer science perspective, algorithmic perspective. Today, we will look at this paradigm from signal processing perspective because our uh, guest speaker is from that domain. Um, uh, and uh, he will have examples in wireless communications as well. The, uh, everyone would agree on the potential of machine learning in uh, wireless communications, but what we wouldn't agree on right away, because really we don't know where the sweet spot is. Um, this uh, tool has been extremely useful in many applications such as voice recognition, text recognition, um, and then uh, more recently, chat GPT and tools of that sort are now part of our lives, whether we like it or not in academia. Now I'm talking as a teacher as well. Um, uh, but anyhow, um, uh, machine learning is making a very fast entry to our lives from all different angles. But still, it is not very clear where the sweet spots are. So this is a want you can touch upon anything and everything, and this is happening in the literature. Every problem uh, we can think of in uh, wireless communications is being touched upon with machine learning, but uh, only occasionally it turns into gold. And it is, again, a big topic uh, when in, in which areas the promise is more. Um, uh, well, basically, the uh, the dynamics are known. Obviously, in many cases, there is uh, a lot of uh, computation involved. That means a lot of energy consumption. And let us not forget that everything we touch upon, there is already conventional way of handling those problems. So it would only make sense if we have comparable results with less resource uh, or things of that sort. Anyhow, now uh, let me say a few words about uh, Professor Paolo Dines. Um, already in the announcement, uh, the bio appeared, a very rich bio indeed. Uh, we had the pleasure to host Paolo at Carton University Department of Systems and Computer Engineering since the beginning of the summer. And in about a week, he's going back to Brazil. And uh, the, I uh, admire Paolo from a number of angles. Uh, not only that, he's a renowned researcher in signal processing and in more recent years in machine learning, but he is a very well accomplished uh, educator. Uh, he has several books uh, on different aspects of signal processing, in particular, um, his book on uh, adaptive adaptive arrays, right? Mm -hmm. Adaptive filters, sorry, uh, Paolo. Adaptive filters is very widely used as a textbook and thousands of uh, citations. Uh, Paolo is a, a professor with the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, as I have mentioned. 
um, the, um, and um, his uh, uh, awards will be too many to mention, but I'll just leave uh, in the with the following one. He's uh, an IEEE Life Fellow and a very active member of the IEEE Signal Processing Society. So with that, uh, I will be turning to Paolo. Uh, the plan is to have the presentation for about an hour or a little bit longer, and then we will entertain the questions uh, at the end, um, uh, and uh, people are more than welcome to write their questions in the chat box. So I will now mute myself. Yes. Um, first of all, I would like to. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me on the other side? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Oh, good. 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 Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank you, Professor Halim, very much for in inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be in, in a place where I, I was so well received and, and um, I made a lot of new friends. Uh, and this is from the bottom of my heart. And I'll also be able to um, uh, meet again a lot of people who live around Ottawa, Montreal and Toronto. Uh, through this uh, invitation, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, well, my talk today is uh, machine learning for wireless communication, but as a professor, I tend to begin the presentation with a little bit of uh, basics of machine learning because the reason is because I, I, I like to introduce my students when they work in a field and try to motivate them. Uh, and I think I have to, they have to understand my language. And my language is not the same language as the mathematicians and computer science uh, scientists they use. Me, most probably I use a, a more signal process and communication language when dealing with the field. And uh, that's why we have to have this short introduction. Uh, I, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, Marcelle Mendoza. She was my, my last PhD student. Uh, but before she graduated, uh, she was hired by University of Luxembourg. And a lot of work that we started in this area got uh, uh, stuck because we didn't find, I didn't find many students uh, after that. You know, the pandemic and all these things. But there are a lot of challenges and, and nice things to do in this area. But again, you know, uh, I, there is a difference between what we what I was doing before and what we are doing now. Uh, and I think the big picture is that machine learning is related to creating models through data. Okay, you you actually trying to create models, or or uh, let's say you're trying to uh, learn a certain model coming from data. Before we used to uh, have some sort of models for our problems. And then we try to, in a, in a sense, use a model-based learning. We, we engineers, you know, with our differential equations, with your filters, with your transmitter, receiver, modulators, communication engineer, we had certain models that we use to learn our, I mean, to make our system to work. So machine learning is a, is a data modeling, I would say, method. It's a method where you, you do everything based on the data that you measure. So it's not, a, in my opinion, it's not automatic that we use machine learning to communication, but there are a lot of things on communications and engineer that we can do with machine learning. Uh, and especially in our case in communications and signal processing, we are we're very much into having online solution, real-time solutions, uh, all these things. Uh, at the same time, we cannot spend you know, a lot of powers or, or sometimes we, we have to, to pay attention to our latency in, in the communications and many other things, but machine learning can still help. You know? So let's see what's the big picture of machine learning. My, machine learning is, in general, we can, we can have this set up here where we have, a set, set of data here, 
which I like to call signals, you know. And this is what I call, why I call what they call reference data, okay? So with this configuration here, we can actually understand a little bit how machine learning usually works in, in, in their, in its, uh, let's say, different types of uh, configuration. Okay, if you take the first type of configuration that we have, we, I'll keep this plot on the right. Uh, what will happen is that the data set has observation or inputs uh, that we want to match to certain labels. That's the case where the, the switch is on position one, and we are trying to actually understand what's happened or trying to optimize this model or adapt this model such that my label matches the output or map the mapping between the input and the output. Okay, so basically here we are trying to model, that's exactly what we do when you do, for example, uh, channel modeling communication. Okay, it's very much like that. Okay, you send a known signal and you have at the receiver a uh, reference signal, which is our, our training signal. And with its training signal, signal we, we kind of find the model of the channel. Machine learning does the same thing, but uh, usually assume that you have an offline or a batch process, okay? But there are more to it, you know? Suppose we, we have the, the if it's, this switch is in position two, for example, here, what we are doing, we are trying to use a blind way of learning uh, about the model or adjust the coefficients of the model. In uh, At the same time, we're minimizing uh, a cost function. The same thing happens in the last case, okay? We are also trying to minimize a certain cost function. But in this case here, uh, what the machine learning, in the first case where you have supervised learning, the machine learning output was trying to match the label signal. Okay, so that's why I call Y hat. Okay, Y hat is a kind of imitation or trying to reproduce Y, uh, uh, which is a label. In our case, could be our training signal, for instance. Uh, and then we have uh, we have when Y is close to the Y hat is close to the Y under a certain cost function, then we we know that the machine learning model is is working properly or it's representing properly. In this case, I consider this 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 other block that I didn't explain yet is just a, is a, is a identity matrix and in, in this case, but could be something else. And in unsupervised learning, as I said, you use only the, the data that I have available. I don't have labels, I don't have training signals, and I have to find out some properties of the data based on my machine learning uh, optimization, okay? Of course, there are other ways of, uh, of doing these things this is what you call seven. Uh, one of them is self-supervised learning. What we do here, we, we create and we take the input data, okay? And I transform the input data to a certain transformation matrix here. And I form the signal Z here and this signal Z uh, in a sense, has to uh, be modeled by the machine learning model, predicted by the machine learning model, if you if you if you want to, to say that way. Uh, and this this, in fact, in this case, what, what I'm trying to do is to try try to create pseudo labels for my my machine for my machine to learn uh, what's hidden inside the, the model. Okay, but it's some. Um, is a transformed version of the input signal okay, or the data signal in the case of machine learning, okay? So when you have unlabeled data, they are used for semi-supervised also uh, situation. For example, there are situations where you can have both. You can have uh, unlabeled signal, which doesn't have a reference, or you can also have a label signal. And if you mix the two models, then you can go to the switch tree here and you can actually perform, a, a, sometimes perform a, 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 some sort of unlabeled, or actually switch two, 
uh, unlabel data learning. And then in the next stop, if you have a, data, a label data learning, you can do a supervised data learning from times to times. I think this is this case is the case where in communication we find a lot of applications. Suppose you have a, a period where you can train about, let's say, a channel model, whatever. And then you're happy with the with the channel, and then after a while, you, you know, you, you, the environment changes. You have to retrain again, so we can go back and forth, and then train in some supervised training. And the unsupervised case, uh, what you're gonna do is just make some small trimming in your model, you know, so that you don't have to do the label training as often. I mean, very often. Okay, so there are many ways or different forms in which we can use these tools. Okay, uh, but you see, not not everything is a par paradise in machine learning. I, I'll just give you an example. In communication, whenever you use machine learning for for a certain application, we have to realize that machine learning tools they also have their impairments, and also what's good for communication is not good for image classifications, voice recognition, whatever. Okay, I'll give you just one small example here. Here I have an image of a panda, okay? And then I disturb this image with a noise, which is very small compared to the power of the, of the, of the pixels here. And then the resulting image is another animal here in which the machine classifies as a hindry, as a kind of monkey, okay? But none of you, none of us will be confused about this, this classification, right? Our eyes can clearly see that these are pandas, but the machine cannot do it. So in communications, uh, we're gonna see in an in a example later on, we see that what we are interested in is, is not the same way of this, I mean, the same form of disturbance that's very bad for, for the machine, but it's very good for the eyes, you know? In communication, we don't know. Maybe what's good for the eyes, not good for the detection of our symbols, whatever, okay? So that's why you have a lot of things to play. I mean, to think and to investigate. Okay, but what's... What's the process of the data? I mean, what are the concepts behind the data? Of course, suppose you have, we have a given process that we, I don't know which process is. Usually the process of mapping a set of, a set of signals in another set of signals of data or data, say I would like to say signals, but the mathematician would say data, okay? Uh, and then what I say is that, suppose I have a process, and I want to map M, M dimensional, oh, sorry, M dimensional data that belongs to a certain space into an output of Y. But usually I have a limit amount of data, okay? This limit amount of data means that I have a subset of the set of data that, I, that will actually uh, enable me to understand the whole process of map, mapping between W and and why, okay? Uh, okay, on top of that, sometimes my, 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 my data might contain noise, which is usually the case of our case in communications, okay? So basically what we do, we have to, in a sense, we have to, given a, a limit amount of data, mm -hmm. I have to come up with a, a, a model which is represents the unknown model or unknown process is how they say it in machine learning, okay? And whatever I get as a solution, that solution will be biased in a sense that it's not the real one and how far from the real one is and what happens if different data that I don't have available in my set comes up, okay? So there are a lot of challenges. It's not as simple as, as, as some people think, although, I mean, the, the um, progress in this area is so fast that every day that there are new ideas and, and new solutions for the problems. So basically what we do is, uh, uh, in practice is that we have uh, a, 
a data set, which I know will map for a certain labels, okay? Um, this could be, for example, uh, if there is a dog here and, uh, and uh, there is a person uh, in the environment, maybe that person should be careful with the dog biting, but not all the dogs bite. So you don't have the whole picture of the environment, okay? Uh, so this is this is a bad example, maybe, but just came from my mind just to make it simple. You know, sometimes I do that with my students. I usually say jokes, but even with this data set, sometimes to to come up with a good uh, or with a viable uh, uh, prediction of the model of this unknown underlying pattern here, what we do, we do some data preprocessing. We kind of uh, change the data, transform the data. And then what we do, we do some feature extraction, uh, which means that sometimes we split the data uh, in some features that are that belong to the to this pattern. For instance, if I, I'm trying to make pictures of a, an environment where we have sand, forest, and ocean, uh, for example, the ocean might be a feature, the forest will be another feature, and so on and so forth. Okay, then the combination of these things might help me uh, to understand better what's in the whole uh, the whole underlying pattern in P. Then you do a feature extraction, as I said, and then I sometimes I do dimension the dimensionality reduction. The dimensionality reduction that sometimes you have a lot of data, okay, and a lot of this data is superfluous or re uh, that are repetitions or they are irrelevant. Some are more relevant than the others. And maybe you should uh, use some criteria to reduce the dimension, the dimensionality of my problem so that I create a set of input data here in which I'm gonna compare with the reference signal. And then before I do that, I, I should do some data partition because usually what we do, we have, when you train a machine uh, to try to imitate some underlying pattern, okay? That machine, after training, you have to test if the machine is working fine or not. But you cannot test with the data that you trained, okay? Just like the communication, suppose you, you train a network with a certain set of data, but then when you're gonna use the actual network in a, in a real problem, the, the signals or the data will be totally different. And you have to be sure that whatever model you're using or your model, whatever pattern you're using will actually uh, also represent the situation when new data comes, okay? Otherwise things can go very wrong. Uh, so basically, during the training step, what we do, we we take a network, for instance, okay, uh, which represents the processes, and I, I change the parameters of, of uh, network based on a performance assessment or a cost function. And then after that, we make a model selection. Among all the models that I have, which one better fits the, the, the training data that I have available. And then after that, I have to test if the chosen model uh, really represents whatever I'm looking for, okay? Yeah. And then there are different kinds of learning. Uh, 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 and the classical way of, of uh, let's say, distinguish the, the types of learning that we do is like Classification, for instance, and regression. Regression, for instance, is when you try to track a model or to track uh, uh, the 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 path of a, of a airplane, whatever. This is a tracking problem. Okay, but in classification, sometimes you have something you have to to decide if it's A, B, or C. For example, if you have a if I send a vector of constellation. Uh, of data constellation represent some bits. So what we have to do, I would say that's a, a kind of classification problem because we have to, to, to we always decide which vector of uh, with whose entries are, are are members of a constellation or a communication system better fits what I observe at my receiver using some criteria, right? So this could be 
could be uh, considered a classification problem. And then on, even in classification, we have sometimes binary classification. If you have a binary number, for example, is it zero, one, and this is a binary one. But if you have multiple features, then situation is a little bit more complicated than we have to, we have to find ways to separate different classes of data that we have, okay? As I said, these are only uh, uh, some general framework for data machine learning. And then if you, again, we, if you look at how can we, I see or uh, I, I, I say model also, understand what supervised learning and super, um, supervised learning do, does, you know, so this is a case, for example, I don't know anything about the data and I have just to, and then I have no labels, I don't have any reference. What I'm gonna to have to do is, this, is to classify if this set of data, they belong to different classes. That's basically what we do in our supervised learning, okay? In supervised learning, we have a kind of separation frontier, you know, when which I have the label and when I receive a processing my data to the network, I can decide if that data belongs to class A, class B, whatever, based on my label. And then we have a clear separation, uh, not in clusters, but a clear separation what who belong to who, you know. And, and there are also other types of learning. Online learning is probably what I like more, which is less used in machine learning field, right? Uh, we like more online learning because we have to receive data in real time and try to come up with solutions for our uh, MIMO communication, maximize our capacity, whatever we are doing communication, we need to do it online. We don't have to do, we cannot do it offline. But also there is there are situations where we, we do some learning uh, and then we are happy with it. And then actively we have to retrain and we have to uh, reconsider if you, what we learned before is still valid. This is another situation that we, 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 we learn by asking. Okay, for example, if you have your, your error correct coder uh, indicating that your, your network is not properly working, then you can go back and give feedback and say, we have to retain this whole thing, or reroute this whole thing, okay, according to the network people language, although I'm not that good. And then you have batch learning, which is what's the most popular way of doing machine learning because it needs a lot of computations. You have all the data available and as much data as you can. And then from there, you have offline to come up with your solution. Again, we have also other types of learning, which is called structured learning. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, things like speech recognition systems, uh, which is able, which is, are able to produce, predict the practical sentence uh, using some formal grammar set of rules is a, a way of structural learning because the structure comes from the language. And uh, then you're learning and using that knowledge for our purpose. And then there is uh, reinforcement language learning uh, in which I, we, we we do some process repeatedly in trying to improve our 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 model quality. But this one I'll, I'll leave for later because I'm going to use as an example. Same thing with adversarial learning is when somebody's corrupt, corrupting your data, or in our case, it's trying to interfere with our communication. Uh, these are the typical things that 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 we can use this idea of. Uh, anyway, and there are there is another issue that's very important in machine learning is the main uh, is the issue of fitting. You know, the fitting is that if you have a, a model which is so rich in parameters, okay, uh, and it'll give you a set of data, okay, I can tell you that I can force that model to actually. Uh, make the decisions right about the data, which one is blue, which one is uh, yellow or orange, okay? And then say, wow, that's, I have a perfect model, but that's when it go wrong. It's sometimes, you know, 
sometimes, no, most of the time when new data comes, this type of models where you did overfit, they will provide very wrong results. Okay. Uh, and this is a situation where we are we cannot afford in communication in many applications. Underfitting is sometimes when your model is too poor and you have a lot of data and it's not rich. Your model is not rich enough to understand what's going on with the model. So the best thing is to have a good fit. Okay. Uh, in communication, I think this is perfectly understandable. So uh, whenever you do a communication and, and a physical layer, for instance, and we have noise and we have, like, for example, uh, we, we, we lose a, a piece of the data due to some unforeseen uh, interruptions. You know, the way you prepare the data to go through the channel. There is always a distribution of the information, uh, a channel coding, whatever. Okay, that even if we make mistakes, uh, I mean, uh, certain mistakes, not very often, I'll be able to correct my my data. Okay, and this is actually the solution that uh, suits us better in, in practice. Uh, th this I will not to go through, but this is, this slide is not mine. I just want to. To show, to tell you another thing that you're gonna find billions of good things in, in the internet about machine learning, some good, and most of them are very bad in terms of quality, okay? But this, I just took one example of one, one fellow in India who, who has some blogs about machine learning and things like that. And actually he came up with something that he, he uh, with a classification of the set of algorithms that is uh, that are available, which are quite rich, but I don't know if they are hundred percent correct because I didn't check. Actually, I'm not claiming that they are not. But you see, you see, there is a machine learning here, and there are several classes of way uh, where machine learning can bifurcate. Let's say, and you have reinforcing learning, which I'm gonna talk a little bit, and there are numbers of the names of the reinforced learning algorithms here, and then the ensemble learning where you, you do some some sort of uh, like Monte Carlo type of, of learning. Then you have a supervisor, supervisor. In the upper part, it has the networks. So that different networks will solve different problems. And sometimes the key of success of our application is to find the correct network, okay? In our case, we, I always say that this is a reference. And this is another, uh, uh, another slide that I collect from, from the internet. Uh, this seems to be from a researcher. Uh, and what he claims is uh, he's taking the biomedical applications here. And he says, well, which kind of network or which kind of algorithm he uh, are most widely used in different types of health uh, or health um, application. Um, let's say, for example, PCA, you know, a classification of uh, outliers in, for example, in the gene uh, expression of a certain individual. You know? And then you have CNN, you know, uh, they use for protein secondary structure prediction, and so on and so forth. So as you see, you, uh, in the magical world, you have different networks which would be more suitable for um, generating the results in different uh, areas of, 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 let's say, uh, detecting a disease or, or, or learning more about our, our genes and so on and so forth. And then you see two classes, which I, I classified before. Unsupervised, this is, we just take the data. And the upper one, we don't have any reference. So, uh, but for why you have reference, for example, for cancer, cancer classification? Because you have a lot of patients who has, uh, I mean, been diagnosed, diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer. Then you can take the data from that as a reference that this is a true cancer case and not so on and so forth. Now let's go to our, our field, okay? Hmm. These are very simple examples, but uh, 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 but I think we have, when we start to, to use machine learning communication, 
you have to start with simple case to, for you to grow by understanding what each building block that you're putting or each network that you're putting as a machine learning tool uh, you don't lose so that you don't lose the, your physical understanding of the thing because if you put a machine learning to solve the problem you're using a lot of data you can solve any communication problem end to end with an infinite number of data okay that's possible there are some people who do that but I think in our case, we have to think about other things, you know, computation complexity, uh, speed of, uh, of learning, whatever, okay, reliability, uh, uh, reproducibility, whatever, okay. So let's take a multipath channel here where we receive multiple versions of the same type. signal. Uh, suppose we are using an FTM just because it's more. It's more popular though nowadays. And then with your FDM itself, you know, uh, we have the situation where if you have your channel has a lot of memory, okay, uh, you need to have a prefix, right? It could be zero prefix, it could be cyclic prefix. But suppose you have in an, uh, you are in an IoT environment, you're trying to use uh, some sort of modulation like FDM, and you know nothing about the channel. You, and, you, and the channels are so different in different places where you're gonna put your device, you know, inside a factory, inside a, a forest, or inside a whatever. You know, I'm talking more more about IoT. Uh, and then usually we need to know the length of the channel, okay? in order to make sure that the FDM provides you uh, not only a zero force solution as a possibility, but a, uh, a solution win in which your receiver has decoupled decision, right? The secret that we have decoupled decision, each entry of the vector that you transmit, you can actually make the detection separately. That's the main thing. When you don't have, when you don't have, uh, uh, that, then you're going to have to have a more sophisticated receiver. And if you lose that, if you, you predict that you need a, a length of your block is like M, and then you see, wow, I have an M block and then I need my channel will be like up to L, okay, of length. But then if you put that same system in a in a region where L is much bigger than you predict, then you might have a poor OFTM transmission or even don't have a communication, proper communication, right? So what if I don't have any, um, any redundance? Or if I have, I use L by two redundance. L by two, why is L by two? With L by two, it's proven that we can still have zero forcing solution. Okay, although our our decisions are not decoupled like in, in classical FDM, uh, but this zero force solution usually you end up with um, you have to invert a matrix, a channel matrix, based on matrix, in which that inversion is usually very real conditioned. Okay, I say wow. Well, this is too dangerous to apply, you know, or it's too dangerous to risk to use half of what I need for for the length of my channel. I mean, for the prediction of the length of my channel. So I would say, well, I, I, I thought maybe machine learning can help us, at least can tell us how far can it go, okay? Uh, by using no, uh, no redundance or some redundance or less than I need redundance and so on and so forth. So. I, I just put as an as example here or as an illustration in this talk, some uh, possible challenges that you can try to uh, to address with this machine learning. So when you put, when we place the redundance, of course we have a loss in spectral efficient, which as I said, might be an issue in certain applications. OFDM also, suffer from peak to average power uh, ratio, 
It means that sometimes we're forcing our power amplifiers at the output of the transmission system. And uh, that, that situation makes us spend more power and, and create on top of that non-linearity that will, it will make you lose everything that you have good at the OFDM, right? Which is decoupling the receiving signal, so on and so forth. Another situation is that suppose you want suppose you want to deploy the system all over the world, you know, in different places, and you have no idea what's the typical model there. You know, small, small devices that you want, cheap devices that you want to place here and there, but you have no idea where they're gonna be placed. So how can I is it possible to use some machine learning to at least make a, a, a prediction of the order of the channel I'm dealing with? My solution is horrible, okay, uh, in terms of computation and practices nowadays. But at least I can show you that some things that are used in machine learning, classical machine learning, can actually be used even to do this simple problem. Although, as one friend of mine say, oh, you're trying to, to kill a... a uh, an ant with a, with a gunshot. I say, oh yeah, maybe it's true, but that's how, in my opinion, sometimes new ideas come, you know, at least that's my feel. And another one, I, 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 I just provided some situations where I have an FDM system, which are prone for jamming attacks, okay, uh, or malicious attacks, uh, and and we, I want to avoid that using the same ideas that they use in machine learning for to avoid the confusion between the remember the, the panda and the and the and the monkey. But the thing is that the way uh, we cheat the machine with images is not the same way we cheat the machines when you're dealing with communication data. So we have to realize how to attack and how to defend from those attacks in the communication case, which are different from the, the uh, let's say, image processing case. So basically, what I, that's my, my advice to all of you. Uh, we have to investigate machine learning to address, to get tools, you know, uh, to solve many of the challenges in wireless communication. I'm talking about FDM, but any challenge in communication. But in my view, that's my view, you, you should always start with your full knowledge of the communication solution. Because uh, some people try to solve the problems doing end-to-end -end machine learning without really concern about, I mean, take into consideration the previous knowledge that you have on communication building blocks. And I don't think this is the best, best way. Anyway, so this little challenge as I put it there, I, I use OFDM, okay, or apply OFDM to try to, to address them. Uh, and then, for instance, I had a loss of spectrum efficient because of my my prefix okay can i use can i still have good solutions with uh, less prefix than required okay using machine learning what if if i have no linearities in between can i improve my performance if i i use some sort of network to make my solutions better and if my channel is unknown can i use some smart way of getting my prefix length that I required for that particular application. And then if I have an attack on my, my communication, can I design a network in which is robust to those types of attacks? These are the simple examples I'm gonna to give to you, okay? And they are all based and they all rely on this, uh, on this previous discussion. I'm not gonna go through this in, in in detail, but just to, to show the setup, because here we have a lot of communications engineer, and I, I am a signal processing guy, and you know, we love, which loves and understands and teaches communication, but I'll never be, I mean, an expert in communication like Professor Halimi and all these big guys, you know. I'm just a, 
as a uh, side player, but who loves this, you know? But anyway, communication is like this. You you have a on FDM, you have a pilot beta. Usually you you generate a set of symbols, and then these symbols you you making them parallel, and then you you create uh, do you perform the inverse FFT as you see. Uh, and add the prefix here. I added a zero prefix as you see here. And then I did some clipping in the signal so that to, in order to uh, deal with this, uh, yeah, PAPR, okay. Uh, and then after that, I'll, I'll, my channel will go through the channel and the channel also will add noise. And then the channel has memory, if the channel has memory. I can have a simple simplifier model here. One part of the channel model uh, um, gives me some sort of uh, intersymmetry interference, and part of the the, the channel will give me interblock interference. Okay, so the channel has a little memory. Okay, but that the interblock interference means that I have to do use some pref prefix to get rid of it. Okay. Uh, and then after that, if I still have noise in the environment, I have to add to my signal some noise. And then when I receive my signal, I have something like that. Okay. Actually, these are all real signals. They are not only drawings. Okay. And then I, if I remove my cyclic prefix, I give my DFT, FFT actually, uh, I end up with a model that looks like this. And this red part here are the ones who are removed when I use enough amount of redundancy. Everybody knows that. Uh, and the nice thing about uh, the OFDM is lies here because uh, this guy here, which I call HC, which would be the equivalent channel model if you look at the signal before, uh, uh, before putting zero prefix at uh, uh, prefix, and before uh, perform this signal prefix and suffix, okay? This machine will be a circulant machine, a oh, circulant matrix, and a circulant matrix uh, is a matrix which can diagonalize by, by FFTs and DFTs. And this is why we are able to make our decisions about our our symbols in an independent way by just estimating the channel gain in each of the tones of the FDM signal, right? And I call this H hat LS. Okay. And then once I have the model, I can easily uh, equalize the signal when I receive the signal. If I have the model, at this time I have the model because I. I just show one example in which I had a pilot signal. And then with the model, I make the equalization and I receive my signal. Everybody knows that. But there are other configurations of FDM systems in which, for example, this is the classical cyclic prefix situation, but we also have uh, another situation where we have zero padding, zero uh, jumping uh, situation in which I still, I'm still able to have a zero force solution. Uh, but with the minimal redundancy of L by two, okay? But then you have to do a matrix inversion. And I want to avoid this matrix inversion using some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, oh, uh, machine learning solution, okay? Uh, I'll go, I'll skip the mathematics. Uh, and this is the case where I, I have the matrix I have to invert, okay? Uh, if you want details, I can give you papers. Okay, now let's see the situation. I, I just sh show which kind of system I'm talking about. And then I, I'm going to implement the system and say, well, the, I'm going to use FCM. I have two problems here. I have high PAPR, and I might have, uh, I, might not, I might not have enough space for my, my prefix, okay? How can I do that? I mean, how can I use FDM? Oh, apply machine learning to FDM. Suppose I have an L by two. That's the case in terms of redundancy. I put L by two by channel. This is, is L. No, order is L. And then L by two is, is my 
my prefix, I know that I cannot use, or FDM will not be able to decouple my, my tones or my data. What I'm gonna do in this situation is just do something different. I'm gonna to try to do my equalization anyway, okay? Uh, and then for that, what I did, I just took my, the estimate that I have, uh, the classical one using training data, and I put the, as input, this model as input of a, a small neural network, just a small neural network. I take the real part and imaginary part uh, of my of my classical least square solution, and I try to to generate uh, what I call ICA in uh, improved uh, channel estimator using machine learning. Okay, and what I did, as I say, is I just took the basic uh, least square estimation. Uh, I passed through this machine, I mean, to this, um, to this small new, new network with only three layers here. And then I improved a little bit my, my channel model, okay? And then again, I'm gonna do the basic uh, frequency domain equalization here based on a new uh, model, and then I make my decision. Okay, this is what I call ICA uh, BFDE, which is the classical FDM plus this new network. This one situation. And then I, I run this guy with several examples and, uh, and also I do a second step which sometimes is necessary, sometimes not necessary, is that before making my, my decision here about the, the symbols that I transmitted, what I did, I, I designed another subnet, which is minimum redundance uh, uh, subnetwork, especially for the minimum uh, redundance case in which I don't have a zero forces forcing solution anymore. Uh, uh, and then I try to, I created this four layer network and this guy is only helping me to detect the right symbols uh, at each entry of the vector, okay? That's basically what it is doing. And then what I did is I call a second network which is called SMDR, which I placed after doing the equalization, okay? And, and this one is only helping me to make the decisions about the symbols I transmitted. And I just show you to you what happens uh, when I start training in different epochs or different uh, times in which uh, I have SDMDR, SDMDR, okay? I'm using this extra OFDM system uh, for training and for validation when I have no redundance and when I had some redundance, but not enough redundance to decouple my, my, my decisions, okay? So as you see here, after some training, I was able to, in both cases, to reduce the loss that I have in different, or the cost function that I have in some in the applications, okay? So, Basically, I apply this for the uh, uh, minimum redundancy case, but I can also ap apply to zero force, zero, zero jamming of FDM, which is, uh, which is uh, another type of FDM system in which the, the, um, the related uh, channel matrix is full rank, but use the minimum redundance. Uh, and I can actually apply the same ideas. Uh, and the same thing I can do for the OLA, which is uh, another type of FDM system uh, in which, again, we don't have uh, the channel matrix uh, circulant, which means that the, the FFTs will not be able to, to diagonalize the equivalent to channel matrix. Uh, and then I receive the signal here. Um, I do uh, remove the zero pad padding. Uh, I do the FFT. I do the equalization using that network, uh, the first network that improved my channel model. And I perform the equalization. And I do this second block here just to improve my, um, let's say, constellation classification, let's say. Okay. 
So I made some letter lover examples with these things, but I'm not going to go through all these plots because otherwise you're going to be bored. But uh, what I'm going, one thing I'm going to show is that uh, you see here is the situation where, uh, of course, this this set of curves here, they are related to the case where I have full um, uh, full. Uh, amount of uh, of redundance that I need or prefix that I need, okay? So you might question, oh, why are you gonna use IFTM for this case, you know? Uh, and I, I also don't consider the case where I have a nonlinear disturbance, you know? And uh, what you can see from here is that even using machine learning solution, which includes S ECE plus MMSC, with the maximum amount of uh, of uh, of uh, redundance, I still have better solution in high no high signal to noise, even low signal to noise ratio, in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, bit error rate. Okay, so what I mean is that even when I don't need to use machine learning to improve my my performance a lot. It still is giving me is giving me a little improvement in performance, but here's the worst case. I have no redundancy at all. I take the normal uh, solution. I get this bit error rate here, and then I have then this guy here. I will have uh, the ICE, which means the first neural network that I proposed as a learning to improve my performance, I get some improvement and I get a little bit more perf perf uh, performance improvements when I use the two networks, okay? And then when in the middle here, the same trend happens, okay? There is no, no linearity here. Here's the case where there are linearities. And of course, because, because of the PER, which is the only linear, no linearity that I put here, uh, as you see, the distance between the classical solution and the one one network here, two network solutions here, they improve the bit error rate a little bit, or actually quite a lot in this case. Uh, when I have no redundancy, and this is the case where I have some redundancy, okay? Uh, and as you see, and if I don't need to have redundancy, even in that situation, the two networks will, will just give me the, the same amount of uh, uh, performance, I mean, same quality of performance. All right, this was the first example I'm gonna give to you. Uh, I don't wanna bore you, but uh, I'll give another one. Uh, I'll try not to go to the mathematics, but uh, suppose I don't, I have no idea which order my channel is. And I, that is one thing that uh, I am blindly have, I have a blind network here. I have no idea how it, how it performs. Then I can use one thing that's called reinforcing learning. So I go to that big table of, of possible solutions for machine learning and search for something that might be useful for that particular application. Might be useful. String. What's reinforcement learning? The big concept is, is words. It's like this. I have an agent, okay, that performs an action. And this is the environment. Okay. I perform an action and I kind of the environment will tell me in which state it is and what was the reward that it got from that action. Uh, in other words, this is another way of thinking of many things that we usually do is like uh, when you, for example, illuminate the channel, you go to the other side and make some measurements, and then you have a feedback channel, a feedback communication saying, that, oh, your signal is good, it's, it's bad, you know. Uh, so just that information, uh, it, it looks like this, okay? It looks like this. So... I'm not going to go to mathematics, but there is a way to quantify this. You know, they call what call what you call Q, Q learning, which is a, is a function that represents how good your choice uh, of or your choice of action is 
is good for a particular state, you are in state, and you want to change that state, and you want to know the quality of that state. I mean, if you're happy or not. Uh, uh, if the quality is good, and then you can even improve. If I change a little bit in my state to another state, uh, what I want to know is that that change is, 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 has a reward or not. For you. No. Okay. So, uh, in town, that, then you say Q value obtained uh, uh, that you have for being in a stake and performing an action. An action. Uh, you have an intermate. Uh, intermediate uh, reward for that action, you know, uh, plus the highest quali high value, quali uh, Q value that you can have in the next state. So the reward will be actually improved because this guy has some correspond to some rewards, but I can improve these rewards. Okay. So you can actually put it in a cost function uh, as a, as a, as a way to, to, to manage my algorithm. And then the next step we're going to do is, the, probably this plot is easier to understand. It's just like this. Suppose I have a state and I, I, I use what they call e-grid policy. And what I do is that with a certain probability E, I pick a random action, okay? Uh, this under rack action is the one that goes to the environment and the environment will actually, uh, and, and uh, you actually, uh, let's say, feedback your system saying how, if this action is good or not. And then the next time I put uh, with probably one minus Z, some state here, that after learning the network, the network learning a little bit about your action, you actually will predict which action you expect from, from the environment if you do some, some action. Let's say I sent something, the network says it's good. So it keeps there in the memory and tells me it's good. Another, another time, what I'll do, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go and sound the environment again. What I'm gonna do, I go to my network and my network will say, okay, with this new data here, with this state, what do you think your environment will, will act as a, uh, as a what's the prediction, predict action that you, 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 you you get from your environment. That's what, what, what we think. Because it, there it, they have a memory and they say, well, this predicted memory is very, uh, matches very well with something that was uh, was already been done before. It's just like a replay, okay? In, in a crude language, you can say that, well, I made an action, that action was good. Uh, and uh, if an action that is close to that was as good as that was played again, okay? Uh, and and the results are not so good. Maybe I can reput the same uh, the same uh, action in the environment. This is the roughly what they do. So in communication, what I thought was like this: suppose I have an agent here, which sounds the channel, and I search for for a reward from the from the as a feedback information. Okay. I create a cost function for that. And I, what I do is that I transmit a, for, uh, a signal with no cyclic prefix. And, uh, and then I increase my cyclic prefix from zero to one by one. I start with zero, one, okay. One, and I receive the action. Okay, the reaction. If the reaction is good, of course it will be positive because I start with zero zero, then I'll keep that in memory. So next time I increase by one again, and then I, I, I measure the rewards. Rewards good, maybe it should increase again, and so on and so forth. By doing that, uh, I using a, a multi-layer net neural network uh, on this lower part here, what I end up was a situation where 
suppose I have a, a actual channel of length 10, uh, or the 10, sorry. And I start with uh, a sig prefix of one. And then I measure the MSC, okay, uh, of my detection. Uh, uh, and when I, I, I'm training the network, okay, what you can see is that my networks reduce the MMC into 100 iterations, then start again, then go up and then go down. And after, after 200 iterations, it, the, the error, mean square error that I get in my detection is very small. So it means that that happened because I've been increasing my CPLN, okay? Sometimes I reduce, sometimes I, I increase. Oh, sorry, how about Sometimes I reduce, sometimes I increase. And then my measure, my satisfaction, I end up with a sort of a stable, a st stable situation in which my satisfaction don't, doesn't change much after I get, uh, like say, a length of 12 in my, in my in my probing of the secrets preference, okay? So what does it mean? It means that by measuring my reward, I had a small reward with whatever action I was doing in, in the beginning. It means that I was increasing one, my sick prefix. Sometimes I reduce one, sometimes I increase one until there was a situation where my reward doesn't change much. And that's exactly when I got the information that the sick prefix of 12 was enough, although 10 was enough, okay? But you can say, wow, is this useful? Yeah, it's a very complicated algorithm to do maybe a simple thing, but I can imagine situations where I have a lot of prefix to, to, uh, to set up, or a lot of, uh, not only prefix, but redundancy, whatever, okay, to set up, okay? It's very hard to do it in practice, but sometimes if you train a network that those parameters, which are the, the prefixes or the redundancy or, or how you call it, when you put in the end of the block there, uh, there is a name for it. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the network, the, in the router, exactly. Uh, the, the length of the information, there are all these things might be learned with this idea. Or reinforce it, right? I, in my opinion. Okay. And, uh, the power, uh, sorry, uh, we have about 20 minutes. I know. Um, so, uh, yeah. Just I'll, I'll go fast. Okay. So, okay. Yes. And then my, my last example is a, is a German situation. Okay. Uh, this is a German situation. I think this is a, actually a, a real one, a real problem. Uh, if you, if you, uh, transferring information through the air, some germans can come. And I actually, I can I can think of a transmitter and a receiver, but this can be generated for, for in many other cases. And you go back to the simple FDM receiver. If you have a channel estimator, I can actually, uh, uh, a pilot signal, I can estimate the channel. It's from the estimation, you can actually make a receiver. But suppose, we have uh, a receiver in which there are some attacks coming from. I'm going to use the same network as before, as a known, I mean, as part of the receiver. But then, suppose I have adversarial attacks in my system, okay? Which means that, okay, I I have an estimate of the channel, and uh, there is a way to make your your receiver more robust if you, when you design your nonlinear model, which is the network here, you make a perturbation in your least square or in your trained model of, this, of the channel, okay? This is what you estimate, this is actual channel model, okay? And then you can try to make, make some perturbation in your estimate so that and this perturbation should be small enough 
so that you is not noticed, okay? Uh, but it's enough for you to change your, I mean, the parameters of your model such that you, for example, you're going to make the wrong detec detection about your set of symbols, whatever, okay? And then actually when you train your network, you can take into account that you might be, might have been attacked by a, by a, 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 a someone or or some other players in in a in a in a uh, I mean in a in a given criminal way. Okay, so what you do is like this. Well, the problem is we have to think about this problem in a different way in communication. For us, so if you look at your eyes here, the machine confused these two guys here. But if you look at the communication case, suppose I have a, an adversarial attack, which is this red guy here, and the original signal that we have if we didn't have an attack. One is very close to the other, but it's quite likely, depending on how we define it, that this small attack is enough for you to lose your information or at least start losing package all the time, okay? So what I did, I'll just skip these slides here. Uh, I, hit, I did three types of attacks. Suppose I have a German who just send noise to the environment, okay? Then I have another German. Uh, I, I try to, oh, actually, I try to calculate the power that I should be send, send here to disturb my communication there. This is called random attack. That is another way. And then I try to design my system to uh, be more robust to these attacks. And this, the results, I'll, I'll show all of them you know, later on so that we don't, we don't have to go. Another type of attack is a, a worst case scenario. Suppose some uh, the person at the receiver end, he has a way of jamming your information because every time you're trying to do this jamming, you're trying to fool the receiver or the person who is receiving, just like with the image case, okay? Uh, you think your system is working well, but there is a way to construct examples in which you're going to make frequent mistakes in your decision, okay? Just to give a rough uh, communication uh, example, suppose you have a... a uh, a constellation of, of uh, symbols and you have uh, a frontier between uh, several symbols and you're attacking exactly where you, the confusion can be, okay? And such that you can, and it's not that difficult to, I mean, to find ways of doing it. So uh, I explained that to, in, in our work. But anyways, uh, and this is a, the case where I'm just putting some noise in the channel model that of your receiver somehow. That's another type of jamming. One, I was putting noise in the environment here and putting noise on the, on the receiver end. And there is a third way of attack in which I, that was my idea, I think crazy idea, but suppose I, I have a, uh, an evil stop here. I'm sending some signal here and there is an, I put an eavesdrop on each end of the communication link. And then uh, I, I, with this guy here, I estimate the channel and this guy is close enough to my transmitter. So he knows exactly what the channel is, at least a, a approximation of it and send this information back, back to the German, okay? Suppose the channel just doesn't change very frequent or very high, fast. Uh, this guy here will be able to create a jammer which would disturb uh, uh, the channel between the transmitter antenna and the and receiver antenna in a smart way, okay? And I, I explain how to do that. I'll skip the equations. Uh, um, and, I, and I did this inspired by the way they do in images, but the, the way they do in me doesn't work here, okay? And the other way around. So uh, here's the explanation. So there in image, they use one, they call, one system that they call, or one way of fooling the system is they call FGSM, uh, which is basically take the, the, 
the sine value of the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters. Uh, and then, and, and you, you, you just disturb the parameters with that uh, vector. And then you're gonna make the mistakes that I made like there with the, with the pandemic, okay? And here I create a similar thing, but especially for, for communications, uh, which doesn't have this clipping thing. Uh, and then I, I tested uh, our solutions for different types of, uh, of attacks, okay? Random attack, worst case attack, which is the, 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 the one that was inspired by, by the machine learning thing and the eavesdrops, which is the one I, I, I just created uh, uh, two, two nodes close to transmit and close to receiver to try to, to create a, a smart way of, of, uh, of disturbing the communication. So I just go into the results. This curve here. There is a question. What was the policy of this agent? What was the uh, policy of this agent? Oh, the policy of the agent is uh, uh, in in our case is to increase uh, the mean square error. Okay, but it could be any other. Okay, if I understood correct, right. I'm just trying to increase your your mean square error with, without you. Uh, pay attention to it, okay? Uh, because actually the formulation is simpler this way too, okay? But anyway, I I suppose I have I didn't know I was being attacked, but I I trained uh, I get my 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 detector or my estimator uh, using a least square uh, method uh, and using. In, I mean, using adversarial or or adversarial signals, okay? So this is what happens. If I had a clean signal, this is what will happen is, is the dashed line here. But if I, I have a tax, you can see that the mean square error is increased a lot, okay? With very small signal, I'm able to, to disturb a lot my communication. This is with a random signal. But if I design my estimate, take into consideration that I have some attacks, okay? Uh, then the situation is uh, kind of better. And uh, as you see here, in this way, I, I have a new network with adversarial attacks, considering adversarial attacks. And then I, I have a network, a neural network in which I took in, I make it robust to that particular type of uh, adversarial attack. So you can compare this curve with this curve. Oh, sorry. And with this curve. These are unpublished work, by the way. So uh, I'm still working on it. Uh, anyway, uh, the same thing with the worst case uh, scenario. I mean, the conclusions are quite the same. But one thing interesting about this is that suppose we are using a uh, uh, a neural network, which I design as a robust one, but I use it in a clean signal. As I see here, this is what happens, okay? I use a clean signal right here. This is the clean signal. And this is the case where I have, a, uh, sorry, this is the case where I have a clean signal, the blue one. And the other one is uh, neural network robust. Okay, uh, because of the constraint to make the, network more robust, I mean, the, the communication link more robust, of course, I lost in performance, okay, in comparison, in compared to the case in which I, I used the network and there was not really real attack, okay, but that's something we have to, that's a compromise that there is no way out, you know, if you want to make the, the system more robust to attacks, you have actually to lose in performance when you don't have an attack. Okay, that particular system. Okay. Uh, but it's still, you know, you can see from here that when I don't have an attack, uh, that's, uh, let's see here, the, when I have clean signal in the least square case, of course, it works very well, but 
works much better, I would say, but is still worse than the case where I, I pick the the clean data and I I transfer clean data through the chart. Question. Uh, how do you distinguish between sudden noise in the channel and the attack in terms of MSCB square error value. Also, jamming is also considered as kind of pre-designed noise. Yes. I create, yeah. Uh, I, let's see if I remember the first. Uh, the second question, yes. I, I created a pre-designed noise. And that's what, what I did is uh, in the EVs drop and the worst case here. Okay, especially in the EVs drop is, I'm assuming the the, the the attacker is on the environment, okay, in the open environment. But the other ones, I assume that someone in your network do that, okay? Uh, that one, I always create the worst case attack, okay? The first question was? How do you distinguish between sudden noise in the channel and the attack? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, well, in the random case, there is no way to distinguish. But the, the 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 worst case and the eaves drop, okay. If it's sudden noise, it's just it will behave like the environment noise. As a reason, there is no problem. Okay. Okay. These are the examples I give so far. Just to actually, well, some of the things are were published, but some of the things are still to be published. But these are only tiny examples of what we can do with machine learning. Okay, uh, and I'll just make a provocation here. That was, that's for Pablo and another one is just for you to, to show that what, what can be done, that will take five minutes uh, outside our, my environment at least, you know, my students, whatever. And I took a work from a friend of mine and I show what he's been doing with that. So you, you might see different problems. One thing that might be used for what Pablo does and a lot of people does is you can imagine that in future networks have situations where you have data everywhere and have neural networks everywhere and uh, you have to actually uh, come up with all these models or all these networks and do what we call federated learning federated learning it means that you have nodes in the network and these nodes are everywhere each one with his own neural networks learning uh, learning at, uh, at each site and also uh, having a server or several servers that will collect all this data that was learned on these nodes and to make, let's say, uh, a better configuration, for example, for the network link, okay? This is a challenge, it's very nice, it's a, something that you can be worked on. And there is a lot of there are a lot of research on this one. I'm not going to go to the details. Then I show you here just the mathematics of how people are doing it. You learn at the edge of the of the network, and then you try to learn at the fusion center or distributed fusion centers too. And then probably this way you can optimize your full network. Okay, this is one thing to provoke Pablo to think with me, maybe. And another thing I show you is just one example that came in a recent paper uh, is a um, deep learning channel estimation in a situation we have a MIMO uh, system with a hybrid beamform. Okay, so this is a sophisticated system where you have uh, some part of your, your beamform and being in the analog domain and some part of the being designed in digital domain. And uh, suppose you have a millimeter wave channel uh, link, and this is a very uh, complicated problem, you know. So what? how can we actually address this problem? One solution that was made by the group of Bjorn Ortenstein, a recent published paper. What he does is, uh, let's see, just to show you how whatever I said here applies, you know. He came up with, suppose I have my Y signal, which is, are the guys who I have here at the output of this network, which I'm trying to 
learn everything about how to design the best um, beam forming here, best beam forming here, best beam forming here. I mean, the analog one, digital one at the receiver and the transmitter and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very sophisticated system. So what that he proposed some networks. Suppose I have the measured signals here, which are sort of labels. And what he wants is those labels he, he wants to train a network will give him the internal parameters of the actual network, which is, for example, the transmitter analog being formed coefficients, the receiver analog being formed coefficients, for instance. Okay. Uh, and then he proposed three, three formulations. So one formulation that goes directly from the signal to the model, to the model, and some indirect model in which he makes a channel equalization, then uh, a hybrid being formed. Okay. So it goes to a, to a middle step here. And then there is a third model, which he does channel estimator for each one of uh, the, the outputs. And then, uh, and then after that, he, he tries to get the parameters of the optimal being formed. Okay, so he played with different networks and these networks are, are drawn here. Okay, as you see here, here are sort of, uh, 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 three dimension matrix or uh, which represents convolution network, convolution network, convolution network, and fully collected layers of, uh, uh, of a long vector, as you see here. So these are different configurations for the network. Okay. And after that, he provided what you can get with this different configuration. I'll just show you what, it, what he was after. Suppose we had a fully digital solution. Fully digital solution, you don't have the analog part. You, you just take the data that you observe at the output, uh, calculate, calculate the information matrix sort of, and you take the SVD of the solution, I mean, of the data, and then you get the optimum transceiver, let's say. Okay, this is a theoretical one. They call, he calls fully digital. And this is what he gets, okay, the blue one. That's an ideal one that you cannot actually do online. Uh, and then he plays with these different networks and then he got the solution here. For example, what they call F1, F2, F3 which are these three here, are the, the capacity that he gets so depending on the, on the signal to noise ratio at the test level, okay? Okay, he, he designed the system, he put the system to work and he was in during the test, depending on the uh, signal to noise ratio, he, got, he gets this capacity here. And these are the other solutions that are available in the literature, except for this one here that was proposed by him, which is the first network here. It didn't work very well, but these two are more or less equivalent. But this third here, it seems to be more computation complex. Okay, so just to show you that what can be done with this technology. So my final word is, Thank Professor Halim for providing me this wonderful opportunity to, to visit his group. And to the group, I, my message is, motivate yourself to conquer and accomplish, you know, so that you conquer for yourself, you accomplish yourself, and then you'll be able to share whatever you got and instruct others or educate others. Because these are, I think, this, and when I say share, it means as an engineer, as a, as a researcher, you provide all your knowledge for better solutions to improve everybody's life. Because this will be the only way the world will be, will be more fair in the future. And you also have to strike. 
not only the only the older gener younger generation, but the older too, because I'm still want to learn for me to okay. So that's all I to say. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dennis. Uh, we have a bit of a sound problem, actually, um, and I even don't know whether people are able to hear me now. Um, uh, people over Zoom, are you able to hear me? Um, yes, everything is perfect. Oh, yes. Okay, that, that is very good. Thank you very much. So um, let us first uh, thank uh, Professor Dennis. Uh, just for those of you who are at Carton University, just a quick uh, housekeeping uh, remark. Here is the plan. I will first take questions from the bridge from Zoom, if there are, and then I will actually close Zoom, and then we can have a discussion here in the room. Then we will have pictures, and then we will go for coffee. How about that? Or whoever can okay. stay. Okay? That sounds good. So now, uh, I just turn to our uh, friends and colleagues in Zoom, and I see very many uh, familiar faces, old friends. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, any questions that I, I have seen, a number of them in the chat, but easier if you could unmute yourself and fire the question. Yes, Professor. You can raise your hand, or actually, here we go. Uh, Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and uh, Professor Paolo for this. But, uh, uh, just I a hope. second, we are unable to hear you. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, please. Yes, um, uh, I said that uh, I want to thank you, Professor Halim and uh, Professor Paolo for this uh, presentation uh, that was uh, so valuable. I'm happy to attend this. Um, I'm a, a master's student with uh, Professor Ashraf uh, at Carleton University, and uh, uh, I'm really interested in 5G. My question is, uh, is there any time cost performance for this model? Like we, we saw a lot, lots of um, uh, performance uh, graphs and uh, 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 results, uh, but in... in, in um, in my opinion, in, in real life channel, uh, if we are talking about uh, communication channel, the most important thing is that uh, how good it is uh, and how good uh, the performance will be in real life. Uh, it's it's dynamically changing. It's non deterministic environment. Uh, so what about the time that this model takes to discover an attack, to adapt to a new um, uh, uh, conditions uh, in the channel, uh, if possible to answer this, please. And thank you. I can. Well, uh, this is a good question. In fact, you, you see, every time you, you come up with a solution with machine learning, for instance, uh, in the uh, attack, uh, in robust and against attacks, you can actually do all your learning offline Okay, and when we place the system uh, on the on the field, at least for those types of attacks that the system were trained to, uh, it should provide robustness. But suppose the type types of attacks uh, change. Usually, if the types of attacks change and the attack is not meant, I mean to to fool your, the, your receiver, you notes the attack anyway. Uh, but if he, he come up with a bright idea of make, uh, performing an attack in your system, which you're not able to, I mean, predict before your training, then you'll be in trouble, you know? Uh, uh, but then that's the name of the game, you know? We have to, uh, because if you don't know the nature of the attack, uh, your solution will be suboptimal, that's for sure. Okay, and to make it online, I and then depends on your 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 choices. You know, one of the things I will tell my student when do when trying to do something related to machine learning, apply to communications, is that you have to keep your building blocks as simple as possible, because if you want to deploy it in a real product, 
that cannot be complicated. Okay, it cannot be. You see, you see all the solutions of FTM today is it so popular because FFTs are uh, are simple to implement nowadays. Okay, but if you put a network in which you have lots of nonlinearities, okay, and that you have to learn online, then you have to be careful. You, if it's fixed or if you have to change the coefficients of your network from time to time, then it's fine. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions? Yes, uh, Professor Öztürk. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Paula, for the great presentation. And thank you, Professor Halim, for uh, organizing this event. So my question would be about the reinforcement learning part. Mm -hmm. So you said there are some iterations you are doing. So I, I'm just trying to understand what are the physical meanings of these iterations. I mean, one iteration is what in the physical world? Ah, uh, iterations, you mean? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's go back. I mean, does it have a uh, any, any physical meaning? Like actually, it, they are. Uh, uh, or... Each iteration means that you're sound this the the environment and and you collect the the feedback i mean is it is a time slot then right each iteration is a time slot Did you get it my answer what is it let's see what uh you mean here right yes yes exactly yeah every Every iteration means that you 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 made some. Uh... Okay, let's go back here. Uh, every iteration, you do a kind of random. You do an action. Okay, that could be random. It means that you you increasing your CP of one. That's an action, and then you expect. Uh, what the reaction will be. It's a very simple case, okay? You have, but of course, because of the network we use, we 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 had to do a lot of iterations like that so that we can actually test our policy. Um, Metin, is that clear? Uh, somehow, can, can I a, a little bit elaborate on that? So is it is it time slow, this, what I'm, wondering actually like i mean i i understand it is uh each each action is a is an iteration okay i understand that yes 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 but for each time slot like what how many iterations you take or each each iteration is one time slot ah one time slot for each iteration as far as i remember okay because i we did this uh this simulation quite a, a while ago but it's one time one iteration yes okay okay Okay, because the you. problem is simple. If it was uh, uh, there, we, we are just checking one parameter, which is the, the length of the, the prefix. But uh, in more sophisticated cases, uh, wouldn't won't be like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the You're presentation. Welcome. Everything. Thank you, Martin. Maybe one final question, if there is any, uh, in the bridge. And. If not, then I'm closing the bridge. Uh, thank you very much. I will post the presentation at my YouTube channel tonight. Bye now. Maybe not this one. I have uh, at least the four slides I use other people's picture. I better remove.